about Jacob. Um, he was, uh, we watched home videos last night to send him off, and uh, he was precocious from day one. Uh, but he uh, impressed us greatly when he uh, discovered uh, mock trial in high school. And uh, he tested it out over a few years. He became the lead attorney for Del Campo High School in Carmichael. He was named the outstanding uh, mock trial attorney in Northern California uh, as a result. Um, he also became a congressional intern for um, Dan Lundgren, uh, served working with Dan Lundgren in his office in uh, Gold River. Um, he's also uh, the intern for Igor Berman on his campaign here. Uh, he just came back after his first year of college. He's, after uh, three semesters, he ended up with an, an AA degree. Um, so it's, uh, he worked very hard, and uh, he'll take a two-year break, come back, finish, and he wants to go to law school, and he actually wants to go into politics himself. So um, it's hard to keep up with Jacob. Um, he thinks a lot faster than his parents do, but um, it's my privilege to introduce him. Uh, as uh, a very knowledgeable individual on the subject. Jacob. Well, thanks, Dad. Um, I got to start off by thanking my father and grandfather. Um, they started talking to me about politics when I was very young, probably at five or six years old, and um, you know most parents wouldn't know how to address these issues to their children, but because of the values they instilled in me uh, when I was little, now that I've um, gotten a bit older through their hard work, I, I think I have what it takes to share a very important message with you tonight. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Dan for giving me the privilege of speaking to you at this event. I, I first met Dan working at a campaign event for Igor Berman. Um, it's been an incredible experience for me over the last two months to get to work with a man like Igor Berman who's really becoming a champion for freedom and liberty in this area. And I'm seeing a lot of things in him that I'm you know, every day taking into myself when I hopefully can stand to defend this nation one day. Um, what's truly inspired me about Igor is his un unique story. Richard talked about it a little bit. Um, Igor and his family escaped the Soviet Union when he was just 13 years old and came to America to seek out a better life filled with freedom and opportunity and free from oppression. Uh, now Igor came here, he barely spoke a word of English. As a matter of fact, on his first day, he spoke uh, such a small amount of English that uh, one of his fellow classmates approached him and said, hey, are you a freshman? And he said, no, I'm a Berman. Um, despite how funny this is, through hard work and perseverance, he was able to graduate high school at 16. Now, Igor soon, Igor soon learned in this country that in America, the average and ordinary citizen uh, the average and ordinary citizen can play an influential and important part in shaping our nation's policy. Igor took this, uh, Igor took this notion and ran with it and uh, became involved with politics. Um, he became the youngest chief of staff in Washington working for Congressman Tom McClintock. And now, the once immigrant who barely spoke a word of English is using his unique perspective of a government uh, filled with tyranny uh, of living under a government filled with tyranny to stand to protect freedom and liberty in our government. Um, now, unlike Igor, I'm not coming before you to speak tonight with a law degree from a fine school under my belt. And to be honest with you, I'm still working on my bachelor's degree. And I'm certainly not running for Congress. But what I believe qualifies me to speak to you all tonight is that, like Igor and like all of you, I have a bright passion for freedom and liberty that burns inside of me. And I'd like to share with you an issue that I feel needs to be at the forefront for our efforts to preserve freedom and liberty in this nation, and that is education. Now, being a recent graduate of high school, I've, um, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of what public education has to offer. My dad told you a bit about the good. I um, got involved with a program called Mock Trial. This, this program was a great opportunity that is somewhat unusual uh, to be offered in a classroom setting, but I had a teacher who taught me the foundation of the Constitution and the ins and outs of our nation's legal system. And because 
I had a passion for the law and um, a teacher who truly believed in me. Through three years of hard work last year I was named, like my dad said, the number one mock trial attorney in Northern California after spending two weeks arguing to defend and preserve Second Amendment rights. Now, I'll be forever grateful to my education for exposing me to something like mock trial and igniting a passion and desire in me to want to gain an education in law and use that knowledge to defend the Constitution further down the road when it's my time. But unfortunately, like I said, during my education I saw bad and I saw ugly. The bad came on my first day in my first class in high school, unfortunately. Um, my expository reading and writing teacher um, started the class by handing us a vocab list and he said you should learn this list you'll be tested on it eventually and then proceeded to sit behind his desk and check emails for the rest of the period now the next two weeks he basically started class giving us a boring piece of what was pretty much clerical work and he really didn't expect us to finish it he didn't put due dates on things he just handed us busy work and checked emails now, after two weeks, I was fed up. I went to my counselor and said, get me out of this guy's class. I'm someone who wants to learn, and I'm not learning from him. So she listened. She appreciated what I had to say, and she transferred me to a different class. But that teacher received little to no disciplinary action, and he still teaches and deprives students of a full education at my high school to this day. Like I said, I saw ugly, too. And that ugly came when I saw a bright, passionate young teacher who inspired students to learn find out he was getting fired because he was simply the most recently hired teacher. This injustice inspired me to take a stand in the field of education. I wrote for my school newspaper and I decided I'd spend uh, a great deal of time doing research into tenure reform and talk to teachers um, to see what they thought of this issue. And I later wrote a, uh, an article at the end of the year on tenure reform. And during my time speaking out to teachers, I, I soon found that a lot of them ideologically believe similar things to you. They, um, they don't like what the unions are doing. They don't like having to pay dues to the union. And they think tenure is simply wrong and outdated. But here's the thing, we've created a system where they can't tell that to just anyone. They all said they admire what I'm doing, but they really didn't know what they could do to help. Um, eventually, this process led me to speak to my school's union representative, and this was quite an experience. He said, young man, uh, young man I'm, uh, I'm deeply sorry about what's happening to the teacher that inspired you, but here's the thing. Tenure's been here for a long time, and it's not going to change, and you're not going to be able to do anything to fight it. So you should just accept it and the system's too big to fix. Now when you tell a passionate 18 year old something like that, they don't just submit and say alright. We, we get fired up and we want to make change. So I wrote that article and I'm still very passionate about tenure reform. It's an outdated institution that bases who stays and who goes simply based on who's been teaching the longest. And we throw out values such as who inspires students to learn, who produces results, the values that basically are what you in the private sector um, keep your jobs or lose your jobs based upon. And as passionate as I am about tenure reform, and as much as I'd love to speak to you about that this evening, that's, that's not the topic I'm addressing you on. I, you see, there's a far greater issue that looms on the horizon in education that's just months away from being implemented everywhere. And that's called Common Core. Now, I first heard about Common Core just five or six months ago. I was in an English class and um, my English TA, she was grading my, my uh, paper for the class. And when she finished, I asked her, um, so what do you plan on doing in the future? And she told me she wanted to be a teacher. And um, I said, you know, I respect anyone that wants to be a teacher. This nation needs more good teachers. Will you stay here in Idaho to teach where we went to school? And she looked at me and said, of course not. Idaho has implemented Common Core and that's going to destroy education. I can't stay here. Well, this inspired me to do some research. And um, I've come prepared tonight.
to talk about how Common Core is going to violate our Fourth and Tenth Amendment rights. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Common Core and um, what you can do as a community to stop it. Um, I'm going to start by telling you about Common Core's stated mission statement that you can find on their website. Now, this isn't word perfect, but it's the gist of the message that um, what we're doing is we're creating a state-led initiative where the states work together using the same curriculum to build a rigorous educational model benchmarked by the other nations of the world that will help our students be more competitive in a globalized economy. Now upon doing research I found out that this mission statement at best is filled with half-truths and mostly lies. To understand Common Core let's start by going back to 1995. This is the first time that we see proponents of a national or federalized curriculum um, make themselves known on a large scale. A bill was brought before the Senate in 1995 and it proposed a federal history curriculum. Now what was in this bill was so radical and un-American that in a divided Senate with both Republicans and Democrats it received just one yes vote. Now after this humiliating defeat the proponents of a federal curriculum receded back into the shadows, but they learned three very important lessons. First, don't call their stated objective a national or federal curriculum. That will scare and alarm people. Um, so instead, make it look like it's a state-led objective. Second, implement their objective in the dead of night as to not cause alarm. And third, Start with a topic less controversial than history, because history is politically charged, and something like English or language arts is hard to tie a political bias to. Let's fast forward to the mid-2000s. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a group called Achieve Inc. They are the writers of Common Core and um, the drivers of the agenda. To successfully implement Common Core, Achieve Inc. had to do three things. They needed significant financial backing, they needed a label that would make their efforts look like they were state-led. And they needed the support of the federal government to push it upon the states behind the scenes. They first went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, you may ask, what would a major philanthropic group like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, want to be involved with something like Common Core for? Bill Gates was the recipient of an excellent education that helped him become what he is today. Um, well, I'm going to tell you that Bill Gates didn't invest $128 million in Achieve Inc. to write Common Core um, because he believed it would produce more Bill Gates. Now that Common Core is published, we see that students will be required not to take standardized tests once a year, but several times a year. And we already know that building an educational model around standardized tests has been failing students. And these new tests won't be taken with a pencil and paper like many are you, like you're familiar with. They are likely to be taken in just about every school district on computers. And when you have to buy that grade of a volume of computers, apples are off the table. So the best option is a cheap Windows computer. So with the simple $128 million investment, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has billions to make from Common Core. With the money behind them, Achieve Inc. went to two organizations known as the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officials. Now these groups have a few things in common. First off, there's not really a single elected official on any of them. Second, they have no legislative authority to write curriculum. Um, and lastly, they're DC-based trade organizations that receive funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well, and from large major textbook companies who also have a significant profit to make from rewriting textbooks to implement into Common Core. Their last step that Achieve Inc. had to accomplish before Common Core was the law of the land was to bring their idea before the federal government. And this was the easiest part. President Obama and Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan bought Common Core hook, line, and sinker and quickly became, its, uh, quickly became its biggest champions. In the worst, um, President Obama said during the government shutdown that he'd refused to negotiate with congressional Republicans because he felt like their tactics were essentially putting a gun to his head to force him to, to, to negotiate. 
Well, if President Obama thinks that what Republicans did in the government shutdown is like putting a gun to his head, what he did to the states to implement Common Core was like holding a nuclear weapon over this country. The way it played out in the worst part of the recession, school districts all over this nation were firing teachers left and right. They weren't getting money in the classroom and they were desperate for any means by which to help their ailing school districts. So Secretary Duncan goes before all the state school, um, st all the state school superintendents and says, look, we see that you're hurting. We see that you need help. We, the federal government, we want to do anything we can to help you. So here's what we're going to offer. We've baked up this $4.35 billion pie, and we want you to all take a seat at the table and have a slice of this pie. And all you got to do is sign up for this great new program called Race to the Top. It's a competition, and based on how well your schools do, you get some of the pie. And um, oh, wait, one more thing. Um, if, if you want to sign up for Race to the Top and get your pie, um, there's, this, there's this little thing called Common Core. Don't worry about it. It's uh, this great new curriculum that's being worked on right now. But you, you just don't worry about it. You can't read it. You can't read it. It's not finished yet. Uh, it'll probably be done in six months. And oh, by the way, you have two months to decide whether or not you want any of that money when your schools are hurting right now. Well, through using these scare tactics and bribery, the federal government through the sheer desperate nature of the states, was able to make 45 out of 50 states chain themselves to Common Core. Now, perhaps the most alarming action of the federal government came when they hired two private testing consortia to write the tests affiliated with Common Core. Now, here's the thing. The federal government does not constitutionally have a right to write curriculum. And technically, because a private organization wrote Common Core and the states chose to sign up for it. They weren't breaking laws. But when the federal government paid millions of dollars to two private organizations to write a test, that's when they stepped over the red line. Um, the heads of these organizations have now said it's their stated objective to use the position they've been given to write the tests, the standardized tests that students will take in such a manner that they can shape and manipulate the curriculum and have Common Core evolve over time. And perhaps the most ominous figure in this whole equation is the head of one of those boards. Her name is Linda Darling Hansen. She's a radical leftist professor from Stanford. And she's worked extensively with a man by the name of Bill Ayers, who's tied to some of the most extreme organizations in this nation. Um, she was vetted to be the Secretary of Education and found too extreme. And that's why we have Arne Duncan in now, who's quite extreme himself. And Bill Ayers was so upset that he wrote an op-ed piece in, I believe, the Washington Post that says that, um, I believe that, that uh, Ms. Hansen should have been the Secretary of Education, but he also said radical economist Paul Krugman should have been the Chairman of the Federal Reserve as well. So we have an individual who's affiliated with one of the most radical men in America, who now has total and complete power over your students' and grandchildren's curriculum. Now, I've not even began to share with you what the curriculum of Common Core is like. But when we look at the way it came about and the individuals who were involved uh, with writing Common Core, it's apparent that it's sown in corruption. But if I researched the actual curriculum and found that it was a great idea, and despite all the players involved with Common Core, they'd somehow produced a good product, I wouldn't be here tonight. And I found that the curriculum of Common Core reflects the individuals who wrote it. I'm going to begin talking about the curriculum by, by speaking about the math standards that have been implemented. On the Common Core Validation Board, there was only one real math professor that was asked to review the curriculum. His name was James Milgram of Indiana University. And he had this to say about the math curriculum. He said to think that what we're proposing to implement on the students here will adequately prepare them for college is literally a joke. Now, let me tell you what a big joke it really is. The geometry curriculum that's being implemented next year is based off an experimental model that's never been successfully implemented anywhere in the world that it's been tried. Now, 
my formal education taught me a few things about the scientific method. It taught me that when you have an idea and that idea doesn't work, that is what you call an invalid theory. Now, any scientist will tell you there's really not supposed to be such a thing as a failed experiment. But there's really not supposed to be such a thing as a failed experiment. And this is because when you learn from an experiment, you're not supposed to repeat your mistakes. You're supposed to try something different the next experiment. But if we're trying something that is or repetitively failed over and over and over again, um, then that actually might be a failed experiment. Now, my English class had a word for this, too. I uh, studied Edgar Allan Poe, and um, anybody that knows Poe knows that he likes to write about crazy people. And when we started the Poe unit, we had to learn the definition of insanity, and that is to try the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. So it's my question, if my formal education has taught me that what Common Core is, is an invalid theory, a failed experiment, and the textbook definition of insanity, why are we trying it? Now, the, Engl the English and language arts standards don't get much better. I really loved English in school. I thrived in that subject, and I had a lot of great teachers that taught me some of my most amazing lessons. I especially love classic literature. In the book 1984, I learned that a government that grows so large um, that it can take away its people's liberty and freedom will eventually strip them of their very identity. In the book Lord of the Flies, I learned that a group of people who have no rule of law will succumb to anarchy. And in, um, in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, I found that a society that values pleasure more than liberty will be blind as that liberty is stripped from them. And you know what? Common Core wants to strip those messages I just told you right out of the English and language arts curriculum. It's their objective to replace those messages with things like technical manuals, brochures, menus, and travel guides. You know, I loved English, but there were students that struggled with that subject. If you think that replacing it with substances, substanceless material is going to do any good, then you're plain wrong. That's just simply a way to get students to hate education. And that's the thing with Common Core is I, I, was, um, I was reading an article in a newspaper where one of the proponents of Common Core, she talked about um, why they were implementing these brochures and travel guides and menus. And um, she said, well, by doing so, uh, we're, we're not focusing on what it means anymore. We're focusing on content. And because we're focusing on content, that's going to give kids in rich areas and kids in poor areas the same chance. And everybody will have an equal playing field. Well, I, I read that and I thought that it's President Obama's objective to redistribute wealth and income in this nation. But it's Common Core's objective to redistribute knowledge. And don't get me wrong, it's a travesty what's happening in the underprivileged areas of America. Those students have an equal potential to do amazing things in this nation, and the fact that there's a dropout crisis in those areas breaks my heart. But stripping away the most fundamentally important parts of our education is not the right way to go about fixing this nation. Now, I'm going to propose to you a solution that comes from a very unlikely place. But hear me out, because the idea is revolutionary. Like I said, I'm, uh, or my dad said, I'm going on a mission to Sweden in uh, just a few days now. And um, having a love for international politics, that's one of the first things I read up on in Sweden, was their political climate. And I, I soon found that our president loves to praise them for socialized health care. Um, he thinks that they're a very forward-thinking country and wants us to implement a system that's, that's similar to theirs. They were one of the examples. but. Any Swede would tell you their, their health care system is going quite poorly right now. The fact of the matter is that there's more demand than there is supply for health care. And in Sweden, a routine surgery can take up to a year to get. And any informed Swede would also tell you that socialized health care is not what makes them great. I just recently listened to a lecture by an economist out of Lund, Uni Lund University named Andreas Berg, and he had this to say about what makes Sweden great. He said, what makes our nation great isn't socialism, it isn't bureaucracies, 
It's the fact that we saw our country failing after decades and decades of socialism. And we, we, we realized to rebuild our country, we had to embrace the principles of the West and look to America. And we realized that embracing the free market could help us rebuild our country. Sweden, since the late 90s, has grown to the fourth largest GDP in the world. And they've since deregulated just about every service offered in their country. And they have little to no tax on their corporations. But perhaps their greatest free market innovation has come in the field of education. Um, some of you might be familiar with what's known as a voucher system. Now, what this is, is if you don't like the way your school's teaching your student, you can pull them out of that school and take your tax money and go to a charter school or go to a private school and find a model that works for your student. You see, Sweden realizes that education is not run by bureaucracies, it's not run by the government, it's not run by unions. It ought to be run by parents, teachers, and students. Now, uh, there's a man by the name of Odd Aiken. He's the, the president of one of the finest private schools in, uh, in Stockholm. And he had this to say about why they implemented the voucher system. And I found it very interesting. He said, well, the reason why we implemented the voucher system is because in our nation, we believe in equality. Equality for everyone, but not equality in the sense that we're all the same, but equality that celebrates the fact that we're all different. And we ought to have an educational model that celebrates those differences, because if we just had a one-size-fits-all model, that would be efficient and not good for anyone. Um, and here's the thing that Common Core fails to recognize. Children aren't cogs in a machine, they're not cattle in a herd, and they're certainly not meant to have boring clerical work for an education. It's my position that children are young minds with the potential to be sculpted into greatness. But see, like Otto Aiken said, this all comes down to equality and our interpretation of what equality means. I believe the fundamental difference between conservatives and liberals in this country comes down to the notion of what is equality. We can look at one line in the Declaration of Independence when this, or when, when this difference started. Um, all men are created equal. Liberals have taken this to mean that all men ought to be pulled down to equality, that we all ought to be the same and define that similarity by the lowest common denominator. See, conservatives and libertarians believe a very different definition of equality. We believe that equality means that God has given all men the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in America, you can achieve the full measure of your creation only through your hard work and your desire to succeed. And government and bureaucracy can't stand in your way. We ought to create an educational model that reflects those principles. We ought to create an educational model that celebrates the fact that every child is different. And creating a homogenized culture where there's only one option will destroy this nation. I'm going to close by telling you four things you can do to build a new educational platform and stop Common Core. First off, Common Core is unconstitutional. I'm not a legal expert. Well, I do kind of like the law, but um, it's obvious that the way Common Core has uh, been implemented violates the 10th and the 4th Amendment. It's been clear through several Supreme Court rulings that the federal government has no place in implementing a curriculum. They've done this through proxy organizations and bribery, but nevertheless, they've created a curriculum that's tied directly back to the federal government. And this is wrong and violates your state's rights. It violates your Fourth Amendment rights because uh, of what they're implementing now with standardized testing. For decades now, when a student receives a standardized test, they give certain pieces of information on race, race, ethnicity, and their parents' backgrounds. But there's been a sacred trust between schools and the testing agencies that this information is to be used only for research purposes. But under race to the top, if states were to receive federal stimulus money, they had to take that information which was, one, which, which was once private and agreed to divulge it to the federal government, starting with the Department of Education, who then had nothing stopping them from giving up that information to the Department of Labor or the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Justice. So now the federal government can collect hundreds of data points 
on you and your children and freely divulge it without your permission. That too is unconstitutional and I'd like to be one of the first to say that Common Core ought to be taken to the courts. Second, I'm challenging you to reach out to every school board member and every assemblyman that you can get to listen to you. Tell them what you think about Common Core. Tell them it's both unconstitutional and wrong for our children. You know, the school board, many of them may feel like their hands are tied, but if enough of them stand together, they can send a message to the state of California to stop Common Core. And I, you ought to reach out to anybody you know in any state and a Tea Party like you and advise them to do the same. Third, and this is perhaps one of the most important um, pieces of advice I'd like to offer tonight is you need to reach out to the youth in this community. I've said some bold things tonight, but believe me, I'm not unique. I went to school with countless kids who can speak and talk like I could, who could express their views about how the government was simply getting out of control. They want to speak out and they want to be heard, but here's the thing, most of them don't know how. I want to challenge you to invite your kids and your grandkids and invite them here to hear your message of liberty. Invite them here to take part in what you believe in. And then don't stop there. Invite, or reach out to history and government and public speaking teachers in your community. Have them bring themselves and their students here. And once they're here, don't let them just sit in the back. Invite them to speak like I'm speaking to you tonight because many of them have bold and passionate things to say as well. And uh, lastly, uh, there's, there's great groups like um, College Republicans, Young Republicans, and uh, uh, Young Americans for Liberty that are on every college campus around here. They're all probably far more educated than I am about many issues that are hurting this nation. If you get them here, I can make you one promise. Children want more than anything to have someone to believe in them. And if you champion the youth of this community, they will be your champions when it's their time to lead this nation. Now, my fourth and final point is that you need to make taking back education your fight again. It's been too long that conservatives have stood in the shadows and watched as progressives have taken education away from us. And we've idly sat by in our private circles and said that unions are out of control and Common Core is bad, but what have we done to stop it? We need to take a stand now. And let me tell you what's going to happen if we don't act. The man who was the head of writing the English and Language Arts Standards for Common Core has just been appointed to be the head of the College Board. Now for those of you who don't know, what the College Board does is they write the most important test in this country, the SAT. The SAT is what determines whether or not you get into a good or mediocre college. And he said that it's his stated objective with his newfound power to not stop implementing Common Core in just the public education sphere. But he believes through manipulating the SAT in such a way that it reflects the principles of Common Core that charter schools, private schools, and home schools will be forced to submit to the Common Core curriculum. This is unjust and needs to be stopped. I was recently watching excerpts from Ted Cruz's filibuster. I certainly didn't have the endurance to watch even near the whole thing, but I watched the parts that were important. And one part that really stood out to me is when, when Senator Cruz said, during World War II, when Hitler was rising to power, there were those that said that this isn't our fight, that this is too big to stop and we should just stay out. Then he said, when JFK said, we're going to the moon, there was a lot of people that said, that's impossible. That was lunacy to suggest. Well, let me tell you, if we didn't do those things, there's a good chance we'd be speaking German right now, and the Russians surely would have beat us to the moon. But we took a stand, and we stopped tyranny and made the most monumental achievement in human history because we dared to do something that was difficult. If you don't take a stand against Common Core, I submit to you that everything you believe in will be in vain back in 1995, that history curriculum that was so radical and un-American that it received one vote in the Senate, that's the logical next step. If the students of this nation are taught to believe that liberty and freedom and limited government aren't essential to a just society, then the future is lost. We need to stop, we need to stop Common Core now. We need not just to fight against Common Core, but champion a new paradigm in education, one that makes a bold and diverse curriculum, one that teaches our students um, 
uh, one that teaches your students in a manner that will inspire them. Um, there's going to be those that hear this message tonight and say what I've had to say is radical and wrong and simply not the way things really are. But the only thing that's radical is Common Core and what its objectives are for the youth of this nation. So I'd like to challenge all of you to fight against Common Core with an age-old principle known as common sense. And I'm going to close by saying that um, in desperate times in World War II after the Battle of Britain, um, Churchill had this to say about um, the youth who defended that nation. He said, never have so few done so much for so many. Now you all may be small in number, but as I look at, as I look at it, you, I think as I speak about Common Core, never have so few had the potential to do so much for the future youth of this nation. Please take a stand and fight against Common Core to protect liberty for the generations to come. Thank you very much and God bless. Now, um, I've uh, done a lot of research on education with teachers unions and tenure and Common Core. If you want to ask me anything about that or uh, my mission to Sweden, please feel free to go ahead. Also, um, we're going to, we're, we're taping this for so all the future, all future generations and other people to see on YouTube and whatnot. Um, can you guys please give me up a second to get the microphone? What was that radical professor from Stanford? What was her name? Her name was Linda Darling Hansen. <coughs> Linda Darling Hansen. Yeah. Are you going to run for office when you get off your mission? <laughs> um, you know, I can't say I've not thought about it. <laughs> um, I, I believe that um, this nation needs people to take a stand for defending the Constitution. And I want nothing more than to do that with the rest of my life. So I, I may very well one day run to protect this nation. Thank you. <laughs> Advanced placement courses. Our brightest kids in the school system are taking advanced placement courses. Mm -hmm. um, will these no longer be allowed with Common Core? You know, I've, I've found little speaking about advanced placement courses, but from what I heard from that representative who said that the objective of Common Core was to make sure that everybody is on the same page, and from the objective of that, uh, that, that head of the college board who said that Common Core ought to be implemented in private schools and charter schools and home schools. I'm thinking that the objectives of the individuals driving this is to really put everybody on the same page. Now, one more question. Um, since I became aware of Common Core just recently, I mean, it's, this thing has been completely under the radar. Mm -hmm. um, I Googled Common Core, and I understand that you know math and English will be the first two subjects rolled out. But in the uh, area of English, 50% of English that's going to be taught in our school systems now are going to be reading technical manuals, mm -hmm. um, and they're not going to teach all of the great literature. They're just going to pick some of the literature to teach. Is, is this what's going on? This is accurate, and as a matter of fact, it's worse. Um, in middle school, they'd like students to learn 50% from literature and 50% from technical manuals. By the time students are seniors, that number is expected to go up to 70%. We will need the assembly. School boards no longer have the power to stop Common Core. They can't change the curriculum. The way Common Core is written, only 15% of the curriculum can be changed or edited by the school boards. So the majority of it is under the control of the federal government. But the states can take a stand and they can vote to repeal Common Core. There's a significant amount of money that they'd be losing by doing so.
So the way you get them to do that is A, you need to propose an alternative, and B, you're going to need to support abolishing Common Core stronger than you've ever supported anything before. So the state legislature sees that there's an overwhelming call from the people to end this thing before it ruins our youth education. Yes? How effective is, uh, she said I'm talking too loud. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> How effective are charter schools? And, and are they going to have any leeway uh, when it comes to the final exams? The other question I have is there's a great worldwide organization, and I don't know if they have schools, and I wonder why they don't, and that's the LDS. Well, I'll, I'll take both questions. Um, Charter schools, it's an interesting subject. I had a friend who was the valedictorian of the Air Force Academy Charter School, and it had an incredible idea. It said that, you know, there's kids that I think, or there's, there's kids that are going to want to be pilots. So let's teach them about aerospace science. Let's, let's get them behind the cockpit of an airplane, and let's get them flying. But see, without a voucher system, they had to receive their funding from private organizations and very small, small grants from the state government. If we implemented a voucher system, you could have specialized schools like that that have tailored curriculums to your hopes and dreams as a student. Um, but there's been some great charter schools. Um, I don't know the specifics, but there's a charter school in New York City known as the KIPP Institution. And it goes into inner cities and it takes destitute youth and it's transformed them into the finest students, some of the finest students in this country. If we look to groups like that and expand programs that work all throughout this nation, I believe charter schools are a very viable option for education. And um, I'm unfortunately unaware of, of um, any attempts to build a LDS-based institution. Dad, do you know of any? The LDS Church has um, many collegiate institutions throughout the world, but um, they've chosen to allow the youth to attend the schools in their area, whether it's homeschooling or charter schooling or public schools. But the one thing that we do do that's different and unique is that the kids before class or in some states during uh, their school day get excused to go to seminary and they get to study for an hour every day and learn about their faith and their belief and uh, understand their relationship with God. So although they don't uh, have uh, high schools all over the country or uh, elementary schools, they do completely support education and subsidize it in many ways. And they want what's best for our youth and they want them to be able to see beyond what they're being told they can't do and what they can achieve. So that's kind of the church's position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few weeks ago we were out, uh, there was an event and I was talking to a school teacher and we were talking about Common Core and she was uh, saying how good it was and I said, well, several years ago our nation was the leading nation in almost every field of academics. Today we're about 64th. And in comparing California with the other 50 states, we're 48 from the top. And she says, uh, and I said, well, how come uh, we, you're taking the um, algebra class, algebra math, and moving it back to the, from the seventh grade to the eighth and ninth grade. And she says, well, she says, we've got to stabilize it and compare it with all the rest of the, the states. Well, what they're doing is that they're not only nationalizing our school, our public schools, but they're globalizing it. And the whole movement is to set up a one world government and one world religion. Mm -hmm. And you can see this happening to our education system, and if, Obama, if the Obama administration is, is uh, uh, completing its course and pushing uh, Common Core, Common Core will destroy our education system as we, we, as we now know it. I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that, and uh, there's, there's a few points I can make regarding the globalization of education. Um, Common Core's objective is to make us more competitive with the rest of the world. And they said initially they were um, um, benchmarked by the standards of the world. 
But recently, they've changed their website to read only informed by the standards of the world. And in legal terms, the word informed can have very vague meanings. So basically, it means that they're aware of the rest of the world, but still aren't necessarily complying in a manner that would make us competitive. And um, the new math standards that have been implemented, they take, I was, I was looking at a third grade math equation the other day under Common Core. They take an equation that's this long, that's a two-step process, and they turn it into a 20-step process. And the crazy thing is, is we're taking simple issues and making them, making them far more complex than they need to be. And you don't even need to have the right answer anymore. If you go through the process and you put in the effort, being right's not important anymore. And if we teach kids that everyone's winners, then, I mean, where's that going to get them in life? Jacob, I have my granddaughter's mm -hmm. fourth grade math. I just copied it a couple hours ago. I started algebra in the 10th grade. Mm -hmm. She's starting algebra in the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is her fourth grade algebra. Page. Yeah. Um, you know, one interesting thing I can say about that is um, as I was studying the, uh, the, the models that some of the best countries in the world are using, um, number one through five, they all have one thing in common. They, they let kids be kids. They don't test them. They don't give them standardized tests, sometimes until they're 16. And they give them math at that level when they're ready for it. But they establish strong principles that help students love education. So by the time they get to high school, some of these top five nations have less than a 2 or 3% dropout rate. They're fully prepared to do math like that and work at a very accelerated rate. And they love school because they weren't, they love school because um, their elementary school wasn't trying to make them into an accountant, accountant or bureaucrat at nine years old. So I, I honestly think that we ought to reconsider um, how we look at early childhood development and uh, the primary years of education. And um, uh, one, one piece of research that I, I left out of my, my talk was that um, there were hardly any early childhood development specialists on the Common Core board. And the teachers that really complain about Common Core in the greatest volumes are those at the primary grade levels because they feel that it's just simply not a curriculum built for young children. Oh. In the 1930s, in the 1920s, we were shipping communists back to Russia. In the 1930s, they realized that they could never win an election. So they decided what they would do would be to train teacher trainers, take over the normal schools, the education system. And that was a 50-year project, and it's been exquisitely successful. And I think that we ought to be talking to every young man who has some skill and talent and brains and say, please go to education and become a professor of education to teach the teachers. We need some conservative. They have taken, the liberals have taken over the whole process very successfully. And, and we're not working at it in the teacher training level as hard as we should. Absolutely. Um, one of my uh, teachers in high school, her job was actually to train teachers, and ironically, she struggled to teach more than most teachers I had. Um, and I really believe we should respect teachers more. Um, we have a model right now that rewards mediocrity, that protects teachers sometimes who refuse to teach, who are, you know, they've lost their passion for education, but they have tenure, which guarantees them a paycheck. This isn't right. We need a model that um, not only creates a more diverse and colorful curriculum, but we need a model that only celebrates achievement of teachers, that rewards them for being great and not protects them for being mediocre. And um, reaching out, I think, to teachers and showing that we support them and showing that we want to make their job easier and better, I think, needs to be part of our objective with what we do in our innovations in education. As I understand it, I think there's about 24, 25 states that have opted out of a Common Core already. 
Um, several states have began the process of opting out of Common Core. I, I don't know whether it's as high as 25, but I believe that there's at least three that have already opted out and several that are in the process of analyzing in their state legislature. All right. Is that all? Well, it's been a pleasure being here tonight, and thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>